The epistle lesson and the text uh, for today is uh, from the book of Acts. John baptized with water, but in only a few days you will be baptized with Holy Spirit, Jesus said. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? And Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or the seasons that God has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up in a cloud that took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they started toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. This is the lesson for the day, and by the Spirit's work among us, it becomes a word from the Lord. Uh, today begins another semester in uh, the life of church school. And since a few of us have been truant in classes of continuing education, I thought we would do a little experiment and turn the sanctuary into a classroom for about 20 minutes. So, and my fancy watch has a timer. It's set for 17 minutes. <laughs> this class has two parts, two weeks. Today I'm going to ask some questions and see where we are with some basic knowledge about the Christian life. What better place to start than at the beginning of the movement? First, uh, some quick things about the lesson for the day. The book of Acts is actually volume two of Luke's gospel. Gos Luke wrote the gospel and then he wrote the book of Acts. It's really one gospel. The life of Christ, the beginnings of the life of Christ that continued with the followers in the church. I've told you that it's a good idea for you to read all four gospels. And that's really true. So. So I sort of half tricked you because really if you're going to read Luke, you need to read Acts as well. And it's because it's part of the gospel message. I highly recommend Acts because it tells you the histories of the way we got here. I want to recommend to you a couple of textbooks. All right? Um, this is a series of books that was written by a guy named Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. These books are called, each of the books of the Bible, uh, Acts for Everyone, Luke for Everyone, Mark for Everyone, that kind of thing. It's a wonderful, accessible, both superior translation of the text of Scripture and also about four or five pages of commentary about each of the sections uh, in the study. Uh, you can read uh, through the book of Luke or Acts or any of the New Testament books and, and get some good basic knowledge and some new insight into both the whole book and the parts of it by reading one of these. Amazon, about 20 bucks, less than 30 minutes. I highly recommend it. One section a day, and before you know it, you will know more about the book of Acts than you ever knew before. So please do that, or with the gospel you've chosen already to read. You have already chosen. 
I really want to know which Gospels you've chosen to read. So that, that would be interesting to see. Well, now to the question of the day. Jesus says to his followers, the seriously committed ones, you will be my witnesses. So let's start by asking, what is a witness? Uh, it was your homework for this week in the prep. So what is a witness? An observer. An observer? There's a lot of talk about witnesses these days for some strange reason. <laughs> so there, there's a particular thing about witnesses. They're, they're things they are and things they're not. What are witnesses as opposed to just an ordinary observer? Someone who's willing to say what they saw, okay? Or, in some cases, someone who gets forced to say what they saw, yeah? What else about a witness? You, you have to be an active person here, I'm sorry. Uh, they were moved, they were moved by what they saw, right? Right? Okay. What? Go. When someone looks at you. Yeah, they have to look. They, a witness has to tell you what they saw and what they heard, right? Uh, they, can't, they can't say what someone else saw or heard. What do we call that? Hearsay. Hearsay. Yeah, I figured you'd know that one, right? And, and here's the other thing. They have to tell the truth. They can't make up a story. Okay? That's why I try to tell you that you, ha that, that you have to be careful about using the word story when you talk about things that happened in the New Testament. You know, the story about Jesus and so and so. The story about... No, it's not a story. It's an event that happened that they remembered. And they saw it they had witnessed it, and they wrote it down carefully, and that's how we got here. Right? So, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Witnesses to what? Uh, events that happened involving Jesus. E events that happened involving Jesus, right? His words and deeds. The words of life. The words of life. Thank you. Miracles. Miracles. The way he treated people. How people treated because of him, how others were treated. What? There's one thing in particular. Think about the time this is said. Crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Which is right. This is right before the ascension. And he's talking about, you will be my witnesses to the resurrection. Why would that be true? Because this happens after the crucifixion and the resurrection. And... He appears to them. And they saw him. And they heard him. And so they could be witnesses to his risen presence. Make sense? It's really pretty obvious, isn't it, when you get to it? It's amazing that it doesn't come to our minds. And, and that leads to a question that, that the class kind of might have already. Why do we have such a problem with the resurrection? It, yeah, it's only happened once, right? Huh? We didn't see it. Yeah. And does that mean that we can't trust what the people said that saw it? Why, why do we have trouble? I, I want to know this, and it's a safe place. It's a sanctuary. 
I'm not going to call you out and say there's something wrong with you. It's a question a lot of us have, myself included. How do we deal with this thing about Jesus walking through a locked door? What's the problem that people have with the resurrection? Yeah, it's, it's completely counterintuitive to the experience of death, isn't it? Right. And especially, especially when we know so much more about death than they did. Not true. Not true. Right? Not true. You know, we, we have problems with resurrection because we in our scientific sophistication in mind can't entertain the possibility that someone could rise from the dead or reappear in some new form because that's science isn't it and part of the reason for that friends and I love you but you have very old-fashioned thoughts about science because you're still locked in a Newton universe and not an Einstein universe because now Scientists, by and large, have more faith in what they can't know yet and are trying to learn than we do. Have you thought about that? Look what's happened to medicine in the last 30 years. They've asked questions about what they don't know yet. And they're really good at it. And, and in a church, we can kind of stop and think about that. But we need to go back here and get some help with that. Because our problem with resurrection is mostly how in the world could something like that happen? Right? They didn't ask that question. They didn't ask that question. And why did they not ask that question? Because he had shown up. They were looking at him. They didn't believe at first, did they? No. So... So we can be honest, and our names are Thomas, right? And it's not because he was a doubter. It's because he was the only honest one in the room who would speak out loud. Isn't it? So so we need to look at the resurrection from the viewpoint of the witnesses. They had a problem with resurrection until they saw him. And here's the thing. Some of them had to see him repeatedly to be convinced. Right? But they were convinced. And then he told them, you are going to be my witnesses. You are going to tell the world that I have risen from the dead. And that I am alive. And that I am the Lord of earth and heaven. Right? So Jesus says that all authority has been given to him. Who gave him the authority? God, right? And and he says, that's why you will be my witnesses. And he says, you will go out and you will tell this in Jerusalem and Judea and all the other parts of the earth and that kind of thing. So so let me just uh, clarify something and help us. We live in these modern and democratic times and that kind of thing. And so we don't have a clue about what this phrase, Jerusalem and Judea and all the other most parts of the earth, really meant. It was a reference back to the fact that when a new king became king, that message had to be published abroad to the whole world. Does that add up? How else would they know that they had a new king? And how else would they know who the person was they were supposed to obey? And that that person was the ruler of their lives. Now, we're more careful a lot about gender language now, and I'm sensitive about that. But the word king can be the word queen in terms of gender stuff, right? And it boils down to the same thing. 
they run your life. They say jump and you jump. They say do and you do. They say don't and you don't. That's what kings and queens do, right? And Jesus is king of a new and different kingdom. And we'll explain that kingdom in part two next week. But it's important that we understand what king means to Jesus. He is launching a new age. He is launching a new way of life. He is launching a, quote, new world order. It's not some nice little political thing. It's a different way the world works from the way it has been working a long time. And it is the way the world works as God intends it to work. And he's the king. So why did they go out and do this? Huh? Because he told them to. Because they were obedient. Because they were followers. And for one other reason. Because he told them, I will be with you always. He said, you've got to wait just a little while. I want you to think this through before you make this decision. I want you to stop and realize that my coming changes everything. You need to think through this commitment that you're about to make. And after you have thought this through, Holy Spirit will come and descend upon you and give you power to be my witnesses. And Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Now, doesn't that sound pretty simple? No. What's what's not simple about it? Following Christ is not simple, is it? No. And, and the, the one great thing about following Christ is Christ, Christ doesn't expect you to do this perfectly. Christ just expects you to work at it. And this is the new way that you see your life and you want to live your life. And this is the way that you think the world around you ought to be because people should... Mo- Act like Christ did and do that to the people that Christ did it with. And if that happens, the world will become more like the place that God wants it to be. And that's really simple. The hard part is what? Doing it. Right? And that's why we're in the room. We need the help of each other. We need, we need each other to help us and encourage us and to guide us and to talk about how it is that when we go out in the world and try to change something for the better, we think, okay, how does Christ want that to be? Do we let people off the hook because their idea is okay? And, and yeah, it's a little bit, no. If they're not treating people the way Christ treats them, we want to help them learn to treat the way Christ treats them. What we forget in this church thing is that we're supposed to be the conscience of the world. The conscience. Do you know what the word means? Conscience. Somebody? To know together. To know with. That's who we're supposed to be. So the challenge is, and the opportunity is, and the command is, and the blessing is, and the joy is, that he is with us always. And he will guide us so long as we just look in front of us and see him there and chase after him. There were 11 people that got the Great Commission. Do you realize that? 
you know, remember one of them was a misguided saboteur, and he was out of the picture. He started with 11 people that got committed to this, and another crowd that said that they would be his witnesses. And we're here. And we wouldn't be if they hadn't followed and been witnesses to a resurrection. Amen.